Well, good afternoon, and welcome to the panel on teaching for the 21st century. My name is Carla Hesse, and I am the Executive Dean of the College of Letters and Science at UC Berkeley. And I'm very excited about the conversation that uh, we're about to have. I'm going to very briefly introduce each of our speakers so that that's done, and then um, in the order in which they'll be speaking. Uh, and we're hoping to leave plenty of time for interaction. Uh, the hope is to sort of try to cover as much of the landscape of uh, emerging ways of thinking about teaching and doing teaching, new modalities of learning, insights from cognitive science, diversity of teaching and learning environments and landscapes, and uh, new tools and technologies. So we're going to begin today with um, Anthony Monaco, who is the president of Tufts University. He became uh, president in 2011, having previously served as pro-vice chancellor for planning and resources at the University of Oxford, where he also directed the Wellcome Trust Center for Human Genetics. He currently chairs the steering committee of the Taylors Network. Well, he will be followed by Jeff King, who is the executive director of the Center for Excellence in Transformative Teaching and Learning at the University of Central Oklahoma. And before taking up that role, uh, Jeff was UCO's, uh, at, uh, at UCO. He was the director of Texas Christian University's Kohler Center for Teaching Effectiveness. Uh, his research and applications interests focus on what academics can do to help their students learn. That seems like a central concern for all of us. Uh, he will be followed by Warren Bebbington, who is here as vice, president, uh, vice chancellor and president of the University of Adelaide in Australia. And before becoming the, vice president, uh, the president and vice chancellor, he was deputy vice chancellor and pro-vice chancellor of the University of Melbourne. Uh, uh, before that, he was on the Dean of Music at Melbourne and uh, also uh, uh, on the faculty at Queensland University. To conclude our panel will be Michael Crow, the president of Arizona State University. He's an academic leader and educator and designer of knowledge enterprises, especially well known as you, uh, in the area of technology policy uh, and, um, and higher education. He's been president of the uh, Arizona State University since 2002, uh, and he's been its uh, guiding leader in the transformation of one of the nation's leading public metropolitan research universities. Uh, he's known for coining the term the new American university. Prior to that, he was my own chancellor's colleague at Columbia University, where he served as vice provost. So I will first welcome Anthony Monaco to the stage. Um, thank you very much, Carla. It's a pleasure to be here to kick off this panel discussion of teaching for the 21st century. I thought I'd fo focus a bit more on education and the evolving nature of higher education, particularly here in the US. A lot of this is due to how um, institutions, and there's a diversity of institutions, of course, um, across the country that are really trying to reflect the needs of the societies in which they operate. Many of them are training or educating individuals for a local or regional economy. Others are doing it on a national or global level. Um, they also have different stakeholders, um, employers, uh, government, families who are thinking about the return on investment of costly um, uh, education uh, for four-year private institutions or, or state universities in particular, and what that means for getting that job. I mean, many of the parents I talk to are mainly concerned about the amount of money they're spending and whether there's going to be a job at the end of that four years. I'd like to take um, an angle here where we think a bit more not so much about the short-term gains of getting a college degree, but also what the long-term benefits are. Some um, people have estimated that about 65% of our, our graduates are going to be in jobs in the future that are yet to be created. And are we educating people for that first job? Or are we thinking about what, they may, what skills they may need for lifelong learning and to adapt to new technologies and new opportunities uh, in the job market in the future? And I think this is really where the college degree is a ticket um, to those broader skills. And one of the things I want to talk about in particular at the bedrock of education for the 21st century is the liberal arts education. 
At Tufts University, this is very important to us. Um, the critical thinking skills, the writing uh, ability to uh, uh, interpret text with new, um, in, in new ways, um, being creative. And what is also very important in that is the strong relationship between the faculty and the students. So they really do have a transformational experience as they explore different aspects of a liberal arts education. Those types of um, individuals, I think, are highly sought after in the employment market because they're not so highly specialized. They do um, offer leadership and really the idea to uh, challenge the status quo and how things are done and think about ways in which they can be creative and innovative. And many of those individuals will go on to be leaders and also uh, adapt well to the changing environment. At the same time as we develop a very strong liberal arts education, um, we are also thinking about what is going to change and what are the needs of employers at the moment. I'm a member of the Business Higher Education Forum, which is a lot of Fortune 500 CEOs and university presidents who come together several times a year to discuss what those gaps are in what employers need and what um, higher education is providing. And one of the areas that I saw when I first arrived at Tufts that needed to be developed was in the area of data science. A lot of students are now majoring in computer science. It's the largest major, major at our university and has certainly grown enormously across the country. But computer science, I think, is one part of a much larger need, which is the big data that is driving a lot of the economy, a lot of decision making. And we need to provide the curriculum and education for that type of uh, computational statistics, um, the ability to manipulate large data, and to draw some interpretations from it. I think this is an important part of an education for the 21st century, which really does complement the more literary or um, skills that you get from the liberal arts education. So we're developing a new center on data science, which will go across the university which will provide both a, a curriculum and a major or minor, as well as uh, research skills for our um, different schools uh, in different areas. That said, um, one of the third areas that we feel is very important to a 21st century education is thinking about how our students are educated for life in how they give back to society. It's not just about getting a degree and getting a job. They are going to be members of communities and they need to engage in those communities as voting in democratic process or in, in, in getting involved with partners in the community to better the society locally or globally. Uh, we take this as a major part of our mission. Um, we have a Tisch College, uh, which works across the university with faculty fellows, as well as students who are scholars, not only in volunteerism in schools and various or nonprofit organizations to help move things along, but really listening to the needs of our community and creating uh, true partnerships where we can get faculty expertise and student um, enthusiasm and passion to make a difference on projects like that. Uh, I'm also chair of the Tawar Network, which Carla mentioned, which is 350 universities across the globe that have this as a major part of their mission. For many of those universities, the, um, the local community looks to the university to provide those types of partnerships. It's important to their economy. It's important to their survival as a community to draw on university expertise, particularly in areas where there might not be as much government support for those areas. So we feel that this is a very, very um, essential part of, a, of a education that you not only major in something, get involved in co-curricular life, and think about your um, academic or professional uh, future, but that you learn how to be um, engaged citizens. This is something that we feel is important to the nation and to the globe, and it's a big part of our education. I'll just briefly mention, um, on the teaching front, we spend a lot of time with our faculty. Uh, we have a Center for Excellence in Learning and Teaching which helps faculty understand um, how to use new technologies in the classroom. So there's lots of workshops and a lot of interest in our faculty in new technologies and how they can enhance the learning experience of their students. We also are putting a lot of effort in 
how faculty learn how to teach to a diverse classroom. That's not only a classroom um, of students from a variety of different backgrounds, but also a variety of different learning um, abilities and learning um, styles. And it's important for faculty to understand that diversity when they're teaching um, in today's 21st century classroom. So I think I'll end there, Carla, and happy Great. to hear from my colleague. Great. Thank you. And now we'll hear from our next speaker, Jeff King. Ah, thank you. Now you guys uh, didn't come in the right order, but that's okay. Yeah, we can not a problem. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, frame a little bit uh, the discussion about teaching in the 21st century. Uh, you can tell by my title, and I'm amazed it fit on one line, um, uh, Center for Excellence in Transformative Teaching and Learning, that I will speak about some transformative aspects of what is happening, but probably what needs to happen more concerning uh, teaching in higher education in the 21st century. If you think about it, and you think kind of on geologic time terms, um, uh, the actual idea of even investigating teaching is not that old in terms of what's going on in higher education. 1957, of course, right here in Berkeley, uh, Center for Studies in Higher Education. It was only 1962, University of Michigan, first teaching center in America at a college or a university. And so in that frame of reference, what we have before us is a scenario in which there's not a long history about what can we do to help improve teaching, to help uh, our students learn well compared to other things that are hallmarks of long standing in the academy. Um, what I like to use as um, a parallel is that higher education right now is facing its own disorienting dilemma. And for those of you not familiar with transformative learning coming out of the adult education um, ethos, the disorienting dilemma is what Jack Mesero identified as um, the thing that makes a person stop and think, uh-oh, I'm not prepared for doing this thing, or I need to do something differently, or what the heck is going on. Um, higher education in the 21st century in some ways is now facing that disorienting dilemma concerning what do we do in order to address the students that we have in our class. And if you leave the faculty out of that conversation, you do it at your extreme peril because the faculty are the ones that are the front line, if you will, in helping 21st century students succeed. So what I would suggest is that the value um, of the teaching part of what faculty do needs to be um, very much emphasized uh, at every level, nationally, at the state level, at the individual institution level, and um, frankly, the historical systems and structures, infrastructure uh, around teaching may not in many places have included the, um, the evaluation, the assessment of how effective a faculty member is in helping her students learn. And for goodness sakes, we're over 20 years after Rob Barr and John Tagg's um, foundational comments on this in Change Magazine, moving from the teaching paradigm to the learning paradigm and answering what's in front of higher education in the 21st century concerning teaching, I think very much is a learning outcomes focus because we're moving to evidence-based practice, data analytics, gathering data to help us inform what we do and do it better. And so I like this um, frame of transformative learning because yeah, you start with the disorienting dilemma, but among the stages that follow, a critical reflection of what you're actually doing now is one of the key stages, and then you gather data. But at the end, you have to decide how do I or the institution fit this new thinking 
into what is my day-to-day -day practice, my day-to-day -day living. And I think that's basically the place where higher education is um, at this stage. And the very good news about this is that there's incredible work being done at um, college and university teaching centers um, to help faculty, help students of all um, uh, of diverse uh, backgrounds, as Dr. Monaco mentioned just a, a moment ago. And we just need to support that. Um, uh, we need to instantiate it if it's not there already. Um, and engaging that faculty center, the teaching center, at an institution is one of the, I believe, strongest ways that you can make the most rapid advances in terms of how do we turn the ship around? What's the trim tab on the aircraft carrier? I think it's the teaching center when leveraged properly. Great. Thank you very much. Um, now we'll hear from Warren Bevington. Thank you, Carla, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, much has been said the last couple of days about the research university, and uh, I'd like just for a moment to take you back to the moment when the research university began, because that happens to also be the moment uh, of the beginning of the last great revolution in university teaching. So this will be a bit of a story, but then I'm from the humanities, so what do you expect? <laughs> um, the year is 1806, and the place is Berlin, and Napoleon's forces have just occupied the city, and a young Prussian enthusiast about the Enlightenment was appointed to reform the Prussian Ministry of Education. His name was Willem von Humboldt. Now, Humboldt was pretty unimpressed with the state of, of university teaching at the time. In European universities in those days, students, they, they were made up of lecture rooms, students sat on straight wooden benches, mm. and the professor sat on a dais at the front. And the focus was on ancient text. The professor prescribed the text, the students recited the text, they memorised the text, they summarised the text. Now, Humboldt was prepared to acknowledge that there was a place in a university for the transmission of old knowledge. What he didn't like about it was there was no place for the creation of new knowledge. He wanted to create a university where the most exciting thing about it was discovery, research. <clears throat> and so at Berlin University, he created a place where there was no prescribed text, no curriculum, no grades, no annual exams. Each student from the first year they were there was given a research, an individual research project and they met together each week not to attend a lecture but in a small seminar room to sit down with other students and discuss their progress with the professor. <clears throat> and Humboldt writes about these seminars in very excited terms. They would be serendipitous, completely unpredictable. The originality of one student would spur on the next and so on. <clears throat> Students flocked from across Europe, England, and the US to see this new kind of university in action. And eventually, over time, by the 1950s, most uh, leading universities in Western countries now had the PhD, which was the new degree that Humboldt had introduced for this exercise, and the research seminar. <clears throat> However, then, about 1970, a terrible thing happened. And that was that people of my age were suddenly old enough to go to university. <laughs> the baby boom generation, that huge bulge in the population, descended on universities everywhere and swamped them. Lecture theatres creaked at the seams. And we were back again into the midst of transmission of knowledge in lecture theatres, which now contain 500, 800 students in my country, often 1,000 students in a lecture, an extremely impersonal, kind of education and transmission now under those circumstances at a level that was in some cases rather rudimentary, a long, long way from Humboldt's vision uh, of the small discourse about research. <clears throat> when I became Vice-Chancellor at the University of Adelaide, we were keen to do something about this, so we took two decisions. Firstly, we decided to stop expanding the numbers at the university. Instead of growing, we would change. We would go back to small groups. Secondly, we made a pledge that every student in every year of every course would have as a centerpiece 
of what they did, what we called small group discovery. A small group, not with a, a teaching assistant, but with a tenured professor, <clears throat> but not just a small group, a small group that was working on discovery, on the skills of research, on problem solving, analysis, criticism, uh, and so on. Now, <clears throat> you might ask how in the mass modern public university, where every day the president has a dollar less than the day before, this could possibly be done. And that was the first thing I was asked. Where's the money coming from? And I said to the faculty, don't even mention money because I haven't got any. Mm -hmm. This is not going to be about money. This is going to be about how a professor spends his week. And so instead of the professors spending their week uh, <clears throat> creating slides, preparing to give lectures, uh, we rolled most of the lecture content over online. So the professor would give a lecture maybe the beginning of the semester, the middle of the semester, the end of the semester. We trebled the IT budget, pulled money out of lecture theatre refurbishments and construction and put it all into IT infrastructure. Uh, <clears throat> and so from then on, the students, most of the time, watched the lecture content at home, online. They came to university for small groups where the professor would begin by saying, OK, what didn't you understand about the material? <clears throat> now, uh, I can't claim this is particularly original. We rolled this in in 2013. We introduced this for all our first year bachelor's degrees, then second year, third. This year, we've, we finished the fourth year, and so it's now pervasive right through the undergraduate <coughs> curriculum. It's, it's a version of blended learning. I guess. <clears throat> but uh, I happen to think that we're at the beginning of another great revolution in university teaching. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that it wouldn't surprise me if in a few short years almost all that is codifiable about the content we deliver uh, is available online and delivered online, probably free, uh, thanks to the MOOCs. We're very involved with the MOOCs uh, at Adelaide. And that will free the time of the faculty to focus on the uncodifiable, experiential learning. What happens around the lab bench? Mm. What happens in the seminar room? What happens in the Socratic discourse? Uh, <clears throat> in other words, on the things that Humboldt thought would be the most exciting thing about the research uh, university. So uh, now, what does this mean for the curriculum? Uh, uh, one thing's certain. It, won't mean vocational training. It probably doesn't necessarily mean the old major elective general requirement we have, uh, you know, a, a, a pattern that is so universal that it just astonishes me there's no critique of it, especially as we've now got evidence that the thing that's transformational is not what you do in the major. The most transformational experience is, is for those students who do the thesis, who do the dissertation exercise. So I happen to think we're headed to an important revolution in teaching, but that the way forward is really the way back, back to the Humboldt ideal. Thank, Thank you. you. And now, last but not least, Michael Crow. Thank you, uh, Carla. I think, I think what I'll do is spend a little bit of time, um, uh, based on the other comments that I just heard, thinking more specifically about the uh, 21st century itself and the landscape of what we've encountered where we're coming from, and I'll use mostly American uh, uh, examples, but I think that uh, what I'm about to say is, uh, applies everywhere, and that is that it, it may be that human beings in the, in the 21st century uh, have finally reached a point where education is now a universal aspiration. Uh, we're actually fighting and, and arguing, and even uh, worse than fighting and arguing, against people who believe that women shouldn't be educated, who believe that education is something that should be doled out. We're, we're past all of the constraints that held us back for, for centuries and millennia, where education was viewed, even from Plato's day, to be something for the few, not for the many. Uh, and uh, uh, that change, which has been highly manifested in the United States in the last 150 to 200 years, is one which is really important to understand what teaching in the 21st century really might mean. If you have ubiquitous demand for learning, if you have aspirations for learning that are going to cut across the entire society, all elements of the society, if you have ever-increasing complexity 
in the evolution of our species on the planet going from 7.5 million to 10 million and global trade and instantaneous change and instantaneous this and careers unlike anything that have ever been experienced before and jobs and adjustments, you know, just think of uh, when we actually do see uh, driverless vehicles, at least in the United States, that means millions of jobs instantaneously eliminated because people were driving all of those vehicles for a living. And so just looking at those kinds of things, what you begin to see is that we are confronting and need to confront an expansion and an enhancement of the university and college-based teaching and research and discovery enterprises that we're presently operating. A couple of data points. Uh, first, in the U.S. since 1980, there's been a fantastic opportunity for students that come from families of modest incomes and below to get a grant from the United States government, of which is almost $6,000 cash, to help pay for their chance to go to college. Millions and millions and millions of students have taken these grants. Less than half of them since 1980 have any degree whatsoever. No certificate and no degree. Less than half the people that have attended college that are alive today in the United States have a degree or a certificate. So one of the things that it seems that we've experienced just at the end of the 20th century is a sputtering, some kind of a, of a set of less than desirable outcomes of the educational enterprise that we have inherited. And so because of the fact that, that uh, education has now become a universal aspiration, it's not likely that that education will mean at some point, well, we'll be satisfied with everyone just having a high school diploma. We'll be satisfied. That would be like saying we'd be satisfied with everybody just learning how to read or count. No, the human spirit is too strong. The human desire, the human drive, the human creativity index, all of the things that we are is too great. And so this notion of, of what we're confronting, we have a system, uh, somewhat like um, Warren just said, it sort of ran its course a little bit. It got overcrowded and broke down a little bit. Schools, some schools uh, decided that the way that they could control their environment was then by admitting only the upper, upper quality students coming out of high school because it's the burden is there's just too many people, too many kids, too many things going on, too much diversity, too many different ways that people think and learn, too many cultures, too many ways. So imagine all of those characteristics and all those variables are expanding. So what do you do? Well, you don't abandon the things that have worked fantastically well. You don't, you don't uh, as some people in the private sector have argued that college would go away, those people have no idea what they're talking about, that somehow technologies would come in and take over what colleges do, those people have no idea what they're talking about either. Uh, they, they're just largely people seeking some sort of uh, personal return from investments that they might make in, in technologies and so forth. But what it is time for us to do is to rethink the teaching model itself in lots of different ways at the same time, to embrace diversity, to embrace scale, to embrace speed of change, not by throwing anything out. The American Greek academies that operate in, uh, at, at, at Bowdoin, at uh, Williams, at Oberlin, at uh, other colleges like that around the country, they're fantastic and they need to keep going and continue. Uh, the, uh, the, the notion of a Humboldtian research university that goes back and flips all the lectures and then drives people into experience-based learning around complex problems and solving all at some sort of scale, we need that. But we also, it turns out, need probably to start thinking about different types of teaching, learning, and discovery institutions. What's happened to us now, and it's really a sad state of affairs, most colleges and universities line up around some aspirational target. We need to be as good as, or as elite as, or as perform in the same way as some other to be named school. They all line up in a simple model uh, of replication with no acceptance, even in the rankings of the Times Higher Education rankings and so forth. It's like, really, you're gonna take 2,000 or 3,000 or 5,000 colleges and rank them all in some kind of line? I mean, really? I, I won't even give you the slang American term for what that means. And so, and so, uh, it's, it's, <laughs> It's, it's not good. <laughs> uh, and so as opposed to thinking about, one, a wide range of colleges and universities and institutions of higher education of different types, different orientations, different mechanisms, different approaches, where the breadth of 
the types of people might go to experience teaching and learning. They can, they can find ones that fit for them. They can find pathways that fit for them and so forth and so on. And so just to add to this just for a second, uh, what we've been doing at the institution that I've been a part of the last 14 years uh, at, at Arizona, Arizona State University is basically taking everything that we can learn from the Wave 1 schools in the United States, the, the original Greek academies, from the Wave 2 schools in the United States, what we call the public colleges that started as publicly financed Greek academies as opposed to church financed or individual financed, uh, philanthropically financed Greek academies, the emergence of the land-grant universities, the Wave 3 schools, and then ultimately the emergence of the Wave 4 schools, which are the research universities, what we've set off on is uh, to be a prototype of what we think of as Wave 5. Not in lieu of any of the previous waves, but as a new type of institution, one which is high speed in its orientation, technologically enhanced, technologically embedded, able to adapt, able to change, able to teach across a range of intelligences, types of intelligence, not levels of intelligence, types of intelligence. We also become, we often become confused about, about what those things mean. And so the long and the short of what I'm arguing for, what the point that I'm making is teaching in the 21st century means finding a way to accept a wide range of approaches. Find a way among those wide ranging approaches to create these teaching environments, to embrace this universal aspiration of learning so that we might find some way to engage the entirety of our society in teaching and learning related outcomes. I'll give you one uh, example. Uh, in the last, um, in 2006, we were visited by a friend of mine, the late Chuck Vest, who was uh, previously the president of MIT and at the time the president of the National Academy of Engineering. And he was going around the country trying to find engineering programs that might be willing to rethink how they worked. And, and because we weren't getting enough uh, uh, women into engineering, we weren't getting enough uh, minority students into engineering. Our engineering, as a result, was overly focused, perhaps narrowly focused, perhaps culturally constrained. Perhaps we weren't able to derive the kinds of solutions that we might derive from engineers because our engineers came from too narrow of a band of our population. So he said, what's your suggestion? He said, well, I haven't found anybody willing to eliminate all their engineering departments and build grand challenge or oriented engineering schools. I said, okay, well, Chuck, we're probably crazy enough to do that here. And so we did it. We eliminated all 11 engineering departments. We created five grand challenge engineering schools. The engineering schools are built around what we think are the kinds of things that young people, millennials, want to work on. Sustainability is one of the engineering schools. Uh, bio and health systems is one of the engineering schools. And so we went ahead and did this. Took two years, one year of arguing, one year of implementing. And then, and then we began this process of moving the thing forward. So at the time that we finished that redesign, we had 8,500 engineering students with a 68% freshman retention rate because we were still operating under the weed out model. We then greatly infused new technologies into this new grand challenge oriented engineering school. And we began seeing dramatic changes. So we went from 8,500 face to face full immersion engineering students in 2008 to 16,000 full immersion engineering students in 2016 and 4,000 online engineering students. We went from a 68% freshman retention rate to a 90% freshman retention rate. So twice as many students face to face with three times the number of women students and four times the diversity in that student body. And so from our perspective in that short time frame, using a new approach to teaching, a new approach to learning using that as just one example, we were able to make dramatic changes in this notion of creating a differentiated learning environment, not to supplant any previously existing learning environment. There's great engineering schools that have no research. There's great engineering schools that are small. Uh, and so uh, we went ahead and did this, and it uh, worked. Great. Well, thank you all. And I'm going to just throw one question out, but I don't want you to answer it. I just want you to think about it while uh, we're inviting other questions. Um, you know, you've all stressed, and I think I completely endorse this, the idea of a diverse ecology of learning, both internal to uh, our campuses, but also in a national and an international landscape. We often, but, and you've all talked about the way in which technology has, has transformed that landscape, and um, I like very much the disorienting dilemma phrase. Um, 
I want to ask you about what I would call slow learning. Um, we often joke at Berkeley that getting an education at Berkeley is drinking from a fire hose. Uh, and I think that's only gotten intensified by the accessibility of teaching and learning instruments, tools, opportunities, and so on and so forth that you know, spill outside of the classroom and saturate everyday life. Um, but there's a lot of cognitive science that's shown that um, more is not better and faster is not necessarily better. Uh, that uh, if we look at the retention rate, the absorption rate, the apprehension metrics that we have of what students retain, uh, it turns out that you know, using a laptop to take notes is probably the least efficient way to learn and that the pen is a little more efficient and the pencil is even better because it actually slows down uh, the ability to uh, mm. uh, take in information, to rephrase information, and it requires more condensation. So, I want to make, put out there a question of what about slow learning, but as we do that, I want to just open, open now uh, the, uh, the floor for questions. And I believe there are microphones out there, so if you just throw up your hands, uh, we'll get them. Uh, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. Francisco Cantu, Tecnológico de Monterrey, Mexico. It has been said that uh, universities uh, nowadays are uh, educating students from the 21st century with professors from the 20th centuries <laughs> using methods from the 18th uh, centuries or, and even before. And some terms have been coined such as the millennials, the digital natives, mm -hmm. and the digital uh, migrants, and even the digital ignorance. No? <laughs> so the question is, uh, for the 21st century, which is the, the theme of this, uh, of this panel, so how are we going to deal with all these uh, differences? Uh, we seem to have, there seem to be gaps uh, between generations. And one specific uh, aspect of this is uh, the thing that uh, education doesn't seem to be a guarantee of getting a job, and education doesn't uh, to be a guarantee of being a good person. For instance, uh, many of the persons that uh, sell weapons or that have the power to start wars are educated persons. So they have gone to school, they have, gone, they have obtained university degrees, but this doesn't seem to reflect on the decisions they are, they are taking. Because we have wars, we have uh, weapons, we have a uh, lot of bad things. So are we missing something in the teaching of the 21st century that <coughs> will allow us to have peaceful persons, uh, persons uh, preoccupied by others and such things? So so I, I take that as a question about what about the moral development of our students? And well, I think I would come back to the, the importance of civic engagement. If a person is being educated just for their own advancement, for their own benefit, and not thinking about the benefit of society to that education, then they will take a path that could be quite different from those that are thinking not only about themselves, but what they can give back to society, whether that's through their research, through their job, or through their actual um, organization of partnerships in their communities to help solve local problems using that expertise. And we take that very seriously as part of our mission, as do many universities. And I think that's a great way to educate um, students to help uh, overcome many of the challenges that we face across society. Would anyone else like to weigh in, or shall we take uh, some more questions? Yeah, I, I would like to respond to that for just a second. Um, and I think simply abolishing a four-word phrase among um, faculty's conception of what they do in working with students would go a long ways toward this. The four-word phrase is, it's not my job. Um, the fact is, we teach the students we have, not the students we want. The students we have bring in a diverse array of needs. Some of those needs um, are very, very important to address because they speak to civic engagement, um, willingness to vote when they get out, um, having what employers say they actually have to possess upon um, hire, and those are things like creativity, ability to work on a 
team with people who disagree with me. All of those kinds of things are incredibly important. If you conceive of yourself as a faculty member, as a content expert, and Dr. Bevington spoke about the transmission model, whose job is to transmit education in an environment where you can pull out what you carry around with you, the smartphone, and that's going to have more facts in it or accessible via it than you will ever be able to put in your own head as a faculty member. I think that um, faculty who take the challenge, who have the courage to say, it is my job to help a student understand it's not all about me. Um, working with others achieves things that cannot be done if I take it on myself. And so reconceptualizing what we do as faculty, I think is really, really critical and the good news on that is that, first of all, at all of your institutions, there's a large cadre of those faculty anyway. It's what draws people to the educational enterprise. The second piece of good news is, at least in my 22 plus years as a faculty developer in higher ed, I have seen a shift in new faculty coming to the institutions where I've worked over the years, and these new faculty are more willing to accept that role, to take that mantle on, and it's a beautiful thing. What it requires, though, at the institutional level is um, the courage uh, for the administration, for the institutional ethos to support that kind of professional development. A, a quick, very um, uh, easy example. If a faculty member wants to take on the um, challenge of flipping her class, for example, because it is um, uh, going to do something that will help improve student learning, the faculty member has to know that, hey, what happens when my student uh, end of term student surveys drop the first semester that I try this? She's got to be functioning from a safe place where the institution assures her, we understand what you're doing, we are supporting you in this, and we take that into account when we assess what you've um, achieved and how you are doing as a teacher. So I think those are some things that can very, very definitely help. I think Mike wanted to come in quickly. Yeah, I think the only thing I would add is that probably very few of us in this room are millennials. Most of us are probably baby boomers or somewhere plus or minus that a little bit. Uh, and so I think it's really incumbent upon us to be cautious about wanting to take this standard human adage that the way things were done before is the way that they need to be done mm -hmm. in the future. I think that we've entered a moment with uh, what I call the homo sapien dot nets, the millennial dot nets, the people born after 94 who have lived with nothing but access to uh, uh, unbelievable amounts of information. They now have access across billions of individuals to anything that they want, anything they can imagine, anything that anyone else could push on them or prey on them with or any other set of uh, positive or negative uh, uh, flows of information. So to blend sort of the two questions, I mean, I think the notion of slow learning is the right concept, uh, but slow learning in a world of ubiquitous high-speed access to everything. And so you have to find a new way to blend those two things together. So if you think of slow learning as the means by which wisdom is derived, mm -hmm. that slow learning is the means by which empathy is derived, and a whole series of other critical human characteristics that we've got to have, how do we then as academia in the world of high-speed access to knowledge and information, in the world of technology, how do we create master learners who learn slowly while having access to everything at the same time, while being immersed in whole new learning environments at the same time. And so how do we create that? And how do we also not throw the baby out with the bathwater? So if there's the, the great tremendous seminar that you had with four other kids sitting in a room, as I did with a fantastic uh, professor of normative political philosophy, I mean, I can remember every, every word spoken in the, in the class, everything that was read, what it meant, how it sunk into my head and so forth. So you have to find ways in which that is a piece of everything. So to me, it's not a function of either or. It's a function of finding a way to blend these things together 
in ways in which humans have never been able to experience those kind of learning environments in the past. Great. I think there's a question here. I can't see the whole room. Now I can. Um. Thanks. It's Phil Beatty from Times Higher Education. I'd just be quite keen to hear what the panel thinks about the role of study abroad in, in teaching. Um, I think there's a, probably a challenge in the UK and the US around the lack of international experience for a lot of, a lot of undergraduates. Excellent question, especially to Americans. So. <laughs> well, I, at Tufts, about 45% of our students um, study abroad either for one semester or a full year. And it's very much encouraged so that you can take your interest in a certain discipline or a certain culture and actually experientially be there and either learn the language better or take classes at a university. And of course, they get involved in, um, in many activities in that country. It's not just about taking some classes. We've also instituted uh, with our mission around civic engagement a one plus four bridge year service learning program. So a range of students who are accepted um, can elect to do a full year of service, structured service learning and groups of five or six in a foreign country. We do it in Madrid and Brazil and Nicaragua um, where they're involved in you know, doing something for that society, learning as a group, getting immersed in a foreign culture. And they come back much more worldly, much more um, understanding their position in the world and I think it has a lot to do with how they finish out their education. I, th I think the only thing I would add is that we, we certainly emphasize you know, going uh, overseas, immersing oneself in other cultures. Uh, we changed the academic calendars uh, to six academic modules per year to allow a student to be able to take all their courses in the first half of the fall semester and then go for a language immersion program in Central America the second half of the fall semester, then come back for the first half of the spring semester, then go somewhere else for the, you know, to do something else in the second half of the spring semester. So we've built that in as a part of our design. But I'll also say that we also have worked really heavily. We, ha we have uh, Native American students from 60 tribal nations in the United States, uh, thousands of them on, on our campus. We have uh, almost 12,000 students from 140 different countries. Uh, we have every socioeconomic group at the institution. So we've created also within the institution a place which is anything other than predictable. Anything other than you're just gonna meet people like you grew up with. You're not gonna meet people just like you grew up with. You're gonna meet every possible configuration at some sort of scale and some level of intensity that you can possibly imagine. Uh, we have thousands of Muslim students, thousands of Mormon students, thousands of Jewish students, all finding a way to work together, study together, work on things together. So yes, we're interested in people going away for semester abroad. What we're really also interested in can you work in a truly global institution in a way that helps you to be a, a, a better learner? Great. Do, I, do we have a few, five more minutes? So i um, happy to have other questions. There's one back there. Uh, so currently, um, some new trend for teaching, uh, for example, Coursera, Moons, and uh, edX uh, had a big influence to teaching. Um, my question is that, um, is it a new trend for uh, future uh, teaching, uh, or uh, the challenges for traditional teaching for the new uh, century, for, uh, Particularly in the next uh, uh, few seconds, uh, few, few decades. So uh, it's a problem, probably. Thank you. So, Coursera, MOOCs, mass online learning. Well, we, we're, very, we're with edX, and we've got 360,000 students, and we <coughs> expect to have a million by the end of uh, 2018. But, you know, um, there's many issues around MOOCs that are still evolving and also the purpose for which you go into MOOCs, there's many, many possibilities. I mean, we, uh, if we fund a staff member to develop a MOOC, it's got to be something that they can use in their regular, as an enrichment of their teaching on the campus. And so the, you know, the off-campus element is a kind of spin-off. 14% um, of ours uh, after um, experiencing a MOOC then apply to come to us. So, you know, it's had a big marketing effect 
uh, for us, but I know My Michael has a much more developed approach at Arizona to, to MOOCs than we do. Yeah, what, what, what I would, I guess, add is that, you know, we're, we're not even toddlers. We're still, you know, babies laying in our cribs when we think about what technology might or might not be able to do, and we have to approach it all very, very carefully. We've, we have built 140 online degree programs. We have 2,000 courses. We have, we have a whole series of things that we've got going on, and, but we're still just learning about those things, still learning how to use them. And so what we're really finding is that the power of these technologies for us that have been most meaningful have been uh, in our full immersion environment, the building of, a, of adaptive learning platforms to allow a person who might be fantastically capable in language skills but might struggle with math and somehow gets left behind with math and we found a way to even everybody up. And so we found ways through adaptive and active learning platforms and this is individualized learning. So where we're headed with all of this is the notion of individualized learning. So if you could, if you could take certain courses in certain ways where it then freed up all your time, your face-to-face -face time to be with faculty to think big ideas and solve problems and work in Humboldtian uh, laboratories and so forth. I'm not, I'm not saying that facetiously, I'm saying that literally. If you didn't have to take Math 101 and Econ 101 and things like that, you could work on your own and work with others and work through technology platforms. And what we have found is that that is a powerful way to learn. Uh, we've got about 40,000 students in a math class right now uh, from around the world, from 190 countries around the world where we're getting unbelievable math outcomes. There are no teachers. It's all big data-based, uh, deeply analytic things. If we can take that math course and the understanding that comes from that and empower those students with that understanding, then they're freed up to accelerate their learning in so many other ways. That's what we're looking to be able to do. Great. Yeah, one very quick comment, um, and it concerns how technology is enabling different kinds of teaching, which is really exciting. Even if it's low tech, uh, in the term of, let's say, YouTube videos. Um, I once heard Jose Bowen, um, the author of Teaching Naked, uh, make a, a pretty evocative comment, and he said, the technology around what's going on in higher education today enables a professor to become the world's greatest teaching assistant. And, and what he meant by that was, um, an instructor in college having the humility to say, do I believe across the entire globe that I am the absolute best person to discuss X content or concept in my discipline? And the answer is probably no. You can probably find that person speaking about that in dramatically effective ways using some incredible graphics and other kinds of engaging um, tools why not leverage that and have that be what is the mechanism that the students uh, uh, use to obtain this? And then you've got the opportunity to work one-on-one, -on -one, to expand, uh, and so forth. So I think uh, faculty taking the humility to take on all of the opportunities that technology um, affords today is, is an important aspect also. I think we are... At the end of our time, um, I would love to pose a number of questions to you, especially how to disrupt the reproduction of 20th century teaching for in our 21st century universities. But maybe we can take that offline uh, uh, in the sidebar conversations. Thank you all for very stimulating uh, interventions. And, and I think that uh, I know I learned a lot. So. Thank you.